Hello everybody, today on the program we are talking about heritage ingredients. So they are ingredients that were historically more common and more used and then for different reasons sort of fell out of favor but then because of interest, renewed interest and curiosity they are coming back into favor. So. Uh, it's a beautiful November 5th out here. We have almost 70 degrees, which is ridiculous for St. Paul. We have Teach a Friend to Homebrew Day today, which is also when I pick up my cider, which I have a video on how I make cider, and I can link that if you like. But I got my cider, I got it made, I pitched the yeast, so now we're doing the intro to this video. So as you all know, brewing has been around for a long time and over the history of brewing, some styles have come, some styles have gone. Uh, within the last, say, you know, 100 plus years, there are a lot of styles that we actually still make today. They might be slightly different, but, uh, or they might be similar. And also within that time frame, there are styles that we are sort of getting back into and they're getting more popular. And also, along with the styles, are also ingredients that, uh, you know, like I said, maybe were more popular and then sort of fell out of favor. So today, on the table, what we have is a uh, heritage malt called Chevalier. It was uh, in the late 18th century no, I'm sorry, by the end of the 19th century, it had become the signature British malt, accounting for 80 to 90 percent of all the barley that was planted in Britain. Um, however, the drawback it had was that it grew very tall. So then, as it grew taller, it was more likely to bend over and, and break, and then that grain would not be able to be harvested. So the yield was lower, so eventually, the types of malt that I suppose had shorter stocks for one reason became more common. Uh, I'll just kind of read some of this information here because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, that could have been the end of the Chevalier story had not been for the Germplasm Resource Unit, which I think sounds like a punk band from the 70s, uh, at this John Inn Center in Norfolk, UK. They maintained a small stock of Chevalier seeds and periodically they would replant them and have them go through their whole life cycle to make sure they were still, you know, vibrant, uh, viable. And then research scientists at the Germplasm Research Unit became interested in its strong genetically rooted resistance to Fusarium head blight. I hate, I hate that stuff, personally. And in 2012, a small plot, uh, 0.2 hectare, roughly one half U.S. acre, was planted and floor malted by the Crisp Malting Group. And so flash forward from 2012, and I think it was 2015, you can actually go look this up, several breweries got uh, a larger shipment of this malt to do some test batches, see how it came out, uh, see what they thought of it. And then now here we are in 2016, and I even have some. So the fine people at BSG Handcraft, so I have to give a shout out to those fine folks. They've hooked me up with some of this malt, and I'm very uh, intrigued to give it a try. I'm going to brew a couple of batches. The first one is going to be my Steam and Wife Lager, which is a California common beer. I've got uh, almost 11 pounds of this malt and half a pound of medium crystal. I'm going to be doing a brew day. I've actually already done the brew day. I have some footage here that I'll show after this intro. And at the end of the day, we will taste the beer. Uh, cheers. I should have a sip of this. This is the New England uh, IPA, which is more like a New England pale ale. Still drinking okay, but definitely missed the mark on the color and uh, clarity. See the other video for that story. But I'm really excited to try this malt, to see what kind of characteristics it has, see how it tastes. So we've done the intro, you'll see a couple of brew day clips, and at the end we'll have a tasting. And uh, another, I was going to mention another one that I have used that's sort of in this heritage 
ingredient category is the Wireman Barca pills, which I made several batches of and did some videos on, and that stuff was really great. I really like that pills most. So just keep your eye out for these different kinds of things. Something to try, something to experiment with. Just give yourself a different ingredient and, you know, keep the brewing hobby interesting. All right, let's get to the brew day clips. The brew day is underway. I did the wort collection last night. Got the boil going now. Got the bittering hops in there. I started the first show of the Halloween run. Which was last night in Vegas. And then I gotta get the old spent grain into a bucket. I got some friends who are got some urban chickens and they're gonna take it. And we're gonna see what happens at the end of the brew day and see what uh, the spear comes in at. All right, so I had almost 11 pounds of Chevalier, half a pound of medium crystal. Uh, you can see the hops, one and a half ounce Northern Brewer 60, half ounce 45, one ounce Cascade at the end. Came in at uh, 10.55, so maybe slightly lower yield than most malts, but basically fine, ba basically about the same. So it's uh, going to be fermenting soon, and we'll come back with the tasting. We are here to taste the steam beer made with Chevalier malt. I don't know if you can see from here. But it is not particularly clear, which I find interesting. I've made the uh, Steam and Wife Lager many times over the years. Uh, maybe it's my most often repeated beer. I often do use it as one to experiment with. But it usually gets clear. And the main difference this time is just this malt. So. I was gonna forgot to look up when this has been kegged, but I would say it's been about a month. It's December 22nd today. I can put it on the screen here to say how long it's been when I brewed it, when I kegged it. But it should be clear by now, and it's not. So I don't know if that has anything to do with malt, but perhaps it does. So what do I think of this malt? Um, I also think that it's a little bit darker than, slightly darker than my uh, usual result where I just use some kind of more neutral base malt and uh, I think like half a pound of medium crystal. So it's a little bit darker I think but what really is different about this Chevalier malt is the flavor. It has a much richer and more identifiable unique malt flavor than whatever I normally use. And when I was drinking it, I was thinking it was like a ripe orange, um, not just a average orange flavor, but that extra kind of orangey flavor, almost like a, uh, if you think of like a dried apricot, that real pungent, deep, rich kind of fruit, sweet flavor. That's kind of what I was thinking I was getting, and I have to attribute it to the malt. Now, um, I did some research to try to find other people that have used this malt. I know some breweries have been able to get it. Uh, the best descriptors I found out of anywhere was this Cheshire Brewhouse. Uh, I assume it's a UK brewery. I, it must be. They make a Govinda IPA and they made a Chevalier malt edition. And some of the things that they have to say about their beer uh, I found really were echoing a lot of my thoughts about this so I just want to read a little bit about this. This is their terminology, their write-up. Uh, Chevalier Barley is very different to today's malt variety. It is much more aromatic, full-bodied, and full-flavored than uh, any pale malts available today. It shouts its presence very loudly indeed. I found that it did. Uh, it is full bodied and full flavored like they say. And then what they say here really hit it on the head for me. Very full bodied, fruity and complex with peach and apricot jam. When I read that I th thought yes that's what I am tasting in this beer. 
I think I just used Northern Brewer hops in here, maybe Cascade. I'm not getting those flavors from those hops or from the yeast. So this malt will give you those kind of flavors. So think of beers where that might be appropriate, where you might like that. I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, it, I guess it works okay in a kind of a straight ahead beer like this. But that's definitely what I am getting. Um, dried citrus. So dried oranges, tangerines, if you ever have had anything like that. Flavors are complex and abundant. Change as the beer warms in the glass. I let this warm up quite a bit. It was about 40 degrees. It's, I got it to be about 50 or over. And I suppose that's true. That's kind of goes without saying that you get some of those flavors as it gets warmer. One of the interesting things they wrote is, in fact, myself and a few others who have had the pleasure of trying beers made from Chevalier Mall are thinking that the common thought that beers are made to go to India had massive amounts of hops added to preserve them is possibly just a myth. And the true reason these ancient beers were so heavily hopped was they needed to be piled in the brew to balance out the assertive and full flavored malt varieties used at the time. And that is uh, possibly true. In fact, I was thinking maybe if I was to make a really hoppy IPA, maybe you would use a portion of Chevalier malt, maybe half, to give it a rich malt uh, body to balance out whatever hops you wanted to put in there. So anyway, I find that this was an interesting thing to try. I was glad that the BSG handcraft folks were kind enough to share some of this malt with me. I have a little bit more, and like I said, I think I might use a portion of it in a different type of a beer. It's definitely unique, and I think as we go forward and you get some of these heritage varieties that maybe are going to be showing up, I encourage anyone to go out and try them. Also, just try other varieties that you have not tried and uh, feature a malt in a beer. That's certainly a way to see what it tastes like. If you, I suppose many of you have not had the chance to use this. If you have, go ahead and, and comment. Or if you've tried that uh, Cheshire Govinda IPA Chevalier Edition or any other beers made with this, let me know what you think. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Catch you later.